God, you are good. You are my daddy. You're I'm in charge. charge. Your, Your kingdom, kingdom come. come. I need help. Heal me. Encourage, Encourage me. Lead me. Pardon me. me. So do they. Those I love. Those, those I, I don't. don't. This hurting world. Thank you. this series on prayer your best 10 minutes because 10 minutes spent in the presence of God talking to him about the concerns, fears, and anxieties of your life can literally be your best minutes of the day. We've condensed all the prayers of the Bible into a pocket-sized prayer that you can take with you wherever you go. It's easy to remember if you'd like to say it with me. God, you are good. I need help. So do they. Thanks. God, you're good. You're my father. You're the king. You're in charge. I need help. Heal me. Encourage me. Lead me. Pardon me. They need help. Those I love. And today, the most difficult prayer of all, those I don't. When word got out that I was going to be bringing a message called Praying for Jerks, I received some great responses, and my favorite was the lyrics to a country western song. Thank you, Kimberly Pipes. I'd never heard this song. I still don't know the melody, but the lyrics are worth reading. I haven't been to church since I don't remember when. Things were going great till they fell apart again. So I listened to the preacher as he told me what to do. He said, you can't go hating others who have done wrong to you. Sometimes we get angry, but we must not condemn. Let the good Lord do his job, and you just pray for them. So, wherever you are, honey, I pray for you. <clears throat> I pray your birthday comes and nobody calls. <clears throat> I pray you're flying high when your engine stalls. <clears throat> I pray all your dreams never come true. Just know wherever you are, honey, I pray for you. I'm really glad I found my way to church because I'm already feeling better and I thank God for the words. Yeah, I'm going to take the high road and do what the preacher told me to. You keep messing up. I'll keep praying for you. <laughs> I pray your birthday comes and nobody calls. I pray you're flying high when your engine stalls. I pray all your dreams never come true. Just know wherever you are, near or far, in your house or in your car, wherever you are, honey, <laughs> I pray for you. That's not exactly where I'm going with this message. <laughs> But we can relate, can't we? We've got those people. We've got those people. We've got those people who bring hurt and pain and difficulty into our lives. And all of our lives, we're wondering, what do we do with those people? In one of his books, Dale Carnegie tells about a trip he took to Yellowstone National Park and came upon a grizzly bear who was in a campground. Of course, by now, the campground was vacated because the grizzly bear was digging through all of the trash and making a meal out of the discarded garbage. And nobody drew close to the grizzly bear with one exception. Out of the woods came a skunk. And the skunk went over and sat right next to the grizzly and began making a meal out of the garbage as well. The grizzly did nothing, Dale Carnegie said, because he knew the high cost of getting even. <laughs> Stop and think about it, and you probably had some skunks wander into your camp. People have a way of stinking up life, don't they? Maybe a friend who promised to help but didn't, or an antagonist who promised to hurt and did. Maybe co-workers treated you like a stepladder, or relatives treated you like a stranger. People can stink up this world. Or maybe the analogy of a skunk doesn't work for you because the people who came into your life didn't just stink up your world. They hurt you. And maybe they're better described as snakes who poisoned you, or, or sharks who took a piece out of you, wondering what you're doing with those hurts, dealing with jerks or dealing with people who bring pain into your life is really at the heart of the Bible. It's even at the heart of prayer. It's at the heart of the most famous prayer in the Bible, and, and that is the Lord's Prayer. 
Remember how he taught us to pray? He said, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven others our debtors. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So right in the heart of the Lord's Prayer is this discussion about those who have sinned against you and how your forgiveness relates to the way you forgive them. Jesus never doubts the reality of your wounds, but he loves to talk about how you treat those wounds. Maybe the first question would be this. Do you know the high cost of getting even? You pay a high price relationally. Have you ever noticed in Western movies that the bounty hunter travels alone? The person who's always settling scores, the person who's trying to go out and settle the score or get even, that person doesn't have any friends. Nobody hangs out with a bounty hunter because you might get caught in the crossfire. You've probably had conversations with people who were just telling you how bad everybody was to them and how they were going to get even and they thought you were listening to them with such empathy but in the back of your mind you were thinking, I hope I never get on your bad side. You see, if all of your life is set about the task of revenge, it's going to be a lonely life. You pay a price, a high price relationally. You also pay a high price physically. Physically. The Bible says resentment kills a fool. Resentment kills a fool. In another verse, Job said, you tear yourself to pieces in your anger. Resentment hurts us physically. Have you ever noticed that when we say that person is a pain in the neck, whose neck are we talking about? <laughs> Their neck or our neck? When a person says, well, I've just kind of got a chip on my shoulder, whose shoulder are we talking about? Those phrases have come into our vocabulary because they're true. When, when you're angry at somebody, it affects you. It is a pain physically. It affects your muscular system, your digestive system. It steals your sleep. You pay a high price physically. But I think most importantly, you pay a high price spiritually. And this takes us back to the teaching of Jesus in the Lord's Prayer. He said, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Before we talk about what this verse says, let's be real clear about what this verse does not say. At first blush, it might leave the impression that we earn our forgiveness by forgiving others. That mercy is a merit that justifies God's forgiveness to us. That it's a triangular relationship that God has. As much as we forgive others, God forgives us. That may make sense in certain religions. That may even make certain logical sense. But that cannot be true for the Christian because that would mean we're saved or we're forgiven according to something that we have done. The Christian gospel says we are saved and forgiven not because of what we have done, but, but why, by what Jesus has done. And any occasion that we make our action the requirement for forgiveness, we've moved from an era and teaching of grace into an era and teaching of legalism. So we have to be careful there. Why would Jesus tell us to earn forgiveness by forgiving others if we're indeed saved by grace? Why would he die on the cross for our sins if we could somehow earn our forgiveness by our own works? Why would the apostle Paul insist you are saved by grace through believing? You did not save yourselves. It was a gift from God. Scripture interpretation always allows the big ideas to drive the small ideas or even the more difficult verses. So this big idea that we're saved by grace allows us then to turn to this passage and say, now what could he be saying? He couldn't be saying that we are saved by our own forgiveness or otherwise we're all lost because all of us have difficulty in forgiving somebody. So what is he saying? Well, let's follow the sequence. The prayer says, Father, forgive us our debts. 
That's what we do. We come to God and pray and we say, Lord, forgive us our debts. In rabbinical teaching in the days of Jesus, a debt and sin were often used synonymously. As synonymously a word? They're synonyms equal to each other. A debt and a sin carried the same weight, carried the same language. Every time I sinned in rabbinical terms, I was incurring a debt to God. It was almost like I had a sin credit card. And every time I sinned, every time I misspoke or misstepped, you know, I was using that credit card. And at the end of the month, I would have this statement that would come. Can you imagine if that would happen? And I would look at it and say, man, there's no way I can pay this. There's no way. I didn't even know I was using my card. At that, I mean, it just, and sometimes I overused it. And it's, oh man, there's no way I can pay this. Jesus, out of his great grace, invites us to go to our heavenly father and say, would you forgive me my debts? And hand him the statement. Would you just forgive me my debts? We don't say, could I get a postponement on paying those debts? Or, or could I just make a down payment on those debts? Or I'm working on a loan to pay off those debts. We come with this audacious request. We, we say, Lord, would you just forgive those debts? Would you just treat me like I never incurred those debts? And if there's anything more audacious than the request, it's the answering thereof. Because through the grace of Jesus Christ, he says, yes. We're forgiven. Absolutely. No hesitation. No fine print. No waiting on the shoe to fall. We're absolutely forgiven. And so we turn, having been forgiven, and we enjoy this grace. We feel a sense of peace way down deep in our spirit. The scripture says, happy is the person whose sins are forgiven. Amen. We're happy. Happy. We're happy because our wrongs are pardoned. And so we turn from God as if, if grace is water, he just poured a bucket over us and then another bucket and then another bucket. We're dripping grace. We turn and we walk away and look who shows up, the skunk. The snake. The shark. The person who brings or the person who brought so much pain into our lives. Any other person would try to get even. On other occasions, we would have tried to get even. But here we are dripping with grace. I mean, we're leaving a puddle of grace down at our feet. Jesus says, can you not now, having been given so much grace, can you not now turn and extend some grace, some mercy, to the person who has wronged you. And Jesus says, as you treat them, I will treat you. Do you want to experience this grace? Do you want to be happy in this grace? Do you want to find peace in this grace? Do you want to find joy in this grace? Then you turn and you give that same grace that you have been given to them. And if you choose not to, if you withhold the grace, if you harbor a grudge, if you remain bitter toward them, then God allows a spirit of bitterness to come within you. The way you treat them is the way he treats you. This is a principle in scripture that God treats us the way we treat others. Do you want to be blessed in life? You want God to bless you, then bless people. You want God to be patient with you, then you be patient with others. You want God to bring mercy into your life, then you extend mercy. In many ways, you manage how God treats you, the emotions that you feel, by the way you extend that same emotion to others. Elsewhere, Jesus said, don't judge others and you'll not be judged. Don't accuse others of being guilty and you won't be accused of being guilty. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and you will receive. You will be given much. Pressed down, shaken together and running over, it will spill into your lap. The way you give to others is the way God will give to you. Think of it this way. Suppose God sent you to the supermarket to purchase your neighbor's groceries, saying, whatever you buy for them will appear in your kitchen. 
The groceries you purchase for them will be the groceries you use for your own meals. The way you treat them is the way I treat you. What do you want in your kitchen? Okay, buy that for them and it will appear. I know it's kind of crazy, but just work with me on this. So you say, oh, I, I'm not too bright, but I can figure that out. I know what I would do. I love double chocolate ice cream. <clears throat> so when I get to H-E-B, I go straight to the ice cream section and I buy several gallons of double chocolate ice cream. I love thick, juicy hamburger meat. So I go to the meat section and I buy thick, juicy hamburger meat. I love whole milk. Not that skimpy skim stuff that Deanland makes me drink. <laughs> I love Christian milk, the way God made it. <laughs> and so I go and I buy several gallons of this good Christian milk and I take it home. And I take it to my neighbor and I give him a box of groceries and I say enjoy. And then I go into my kitchen and look what's there. Hamburger meat, ice cream, good Christian milk. It all works. But then one day I look out my front window and I see that my neighbor's garbage has blown into my front lawn. And so from my front door, I yell over to my neighbor who's sitting out on his porch. Hey, buddy, get over here and clean up the garbage. He says, ah, I'll get to it next week. I got company coming, I tell him. He says, it's okay. My garbage is good fertilizer for your garden. Double. I'm just about to walk over there and give him the hello. <laughs> when God reminds me, Max, it's time to go to the grocery store and shop for your neighbor. So I'm driving to the grocery store, stewing and angry, and I think, mm -hmm. I'm going to get even. This time, I don't get him any double chocolate ice cream. And this time, I don't get him any thick, juicy hamburger steak. I go straight to the anchovies, <laughs> sardines. I skip the good stuff. I buy him frozen okra. <laughs> and rice. Mm. Brown rice. <laughs> Skim milk. And I go to the day-old bread section and I find him a loaf of bread that's crusty and has little green spots. <laughs> this is what he deserves. So I take it, put it in a box, drive home, take it over to him, place it on his lap and say, enjoy your dinner. <laughs> but all my revenge and stewing and simmering worked up an appetite, so I go in my kitchen. Guess what's waiting on me? Sardines. Skim milk. Crusty, day-old bread. It's this interesting principle that God gives us. And that is the way you treat them is the way I treat you. And here's my question. My question is, how long have you been eating sardines? and okra. Maybe you know who Jesus is. Maybe you've acknowledged him as your redeemer and a savior. Maybe you have acknowledged that you need him to forgive you and you've received his forgiveness, but still you have this just kind of, I don't know, outlook, anger, bitterness, could it be that God is giving you a taste of your own shopping? Could it be that God is just letting you live with this at the hope that you will give them grace so that you can experience the grace? We're talking about abundant life here. We're talking about God giving happiness and freedom and finally setting you free from some hidden and ancient hurts in your life. I say that because I have a hunch that there may be those listening who'll say, well, you know, I'm really not ticked off at anybody. And God bless you, but be careful 
because even the best of us might have these old hurts. We never quite forgave that coach for kicking us off the team. We never quite forgave our dad for not being a dad. Or we not, never quite forgave our brother for being anything but a brother. We've moved on, and it's not like we're processing. It's not like we're stewing. It's not like we're out to get him or her. But it, it, there's just, I don't know, kind of a thorn that has never been extracted. And sometimes this, this anger is toward a people group. And it manifests itself in a, in a subtle prejudice. Well, all people from the South are that way. Or all people north of the Mason-Dixon are that way. Or all women are that way. Or all men are that way. Or all young people are that way. Or all rich people are that way. Or all poor people are that way. Or all... And maybe this isn't even something that happened in you. Maybe you learned this. In a sense, this, this bigotry, this prejudice, this anger, which is what prejudice is. It's an anger toward a people group. Maybe you inherited this. In a sense, it's generational. It's just the way your family thinks. It's just been passed down from people to people. And maybe you, didn't really, you just grew up surrounded with this worldview, this outlook, and it can stop right now. Whether it's personal or whether it's a population group, it can stop right now. My prayer for this message this week has simply been this. Lord, go deep. Show us where we have hidden hurts. And show us, Lord, how you can heal these hurts. Because I really believe, dear friend, that God can set you free. He can. And that the real answer, the real answer is just going to Jesus. And asking the one who came to set the captives free, to set you free from your own hate. It's hard to forgive people, but let me tell you something. It's much harder to hate people. It's hard to forgive. I know it. But I've got to tell you, it's much harder to hate people. And if I can remind you of this, forgiveness is not just a good idea from Jesus. It's not just a suggestion of Jesus. It's a command. It's a command. It's part of being a disciple. And being a disciple is not eating at the cafeteria line. We don't pick and choose what we want to obey and not. And I know when we come up to that big pot of forgiveness, we all want to just push the tray down and move over to something else, but we can't. God's command for our own good is to forgive our enemies. And he gives us a very practical way to do this. And this brings us to the final point. And it's very simple. Pray for your enemies. Just pray for them. Pray for them. It doesn't have to be a fancy prayer. To be honest, it doesn't have to be a heartfelt prayer. Sometimes we just pray out of obedience. Okay, Lord, you told me to pray for him. I'm still angry at him, but I'm praying for him. I'm praying for him. That's a step toward release right there. At least you're not cursing him, right? You're praying for him. And as you continue to pray for him, them or her, you find that anger begin to subside because you cannot at once hate someone and pray for him. Jesus is the ultimate model here, right? As he hung on the cross, remember what he prayed. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And you remember the setting, Jesus hanging on the cross. And those onlookers, those people who stood at the foot of the cross, it wasn't content just to watch him die. They had to, they had to reach into their quiver and pull out bows and dip the tip of the bow into acidic statements and just, shoo. he saved others, he can't save himself. If you're the son of God, if you're the king of the world, come down from there. They hurled insults at him. And Jesus responded by praying for them. He said, Father, just forgive them. Look at this. Because they don't know what they're doing. 
I'm not sure any of us really know what we're doing. I'm not sure the person who hurt you knew what he or she was doing. To a degree, we're all confused, right? All of us are trying to figure out how we got on this earth and where we're headed after this earth. Nobody knows all the answers. And I think in the confusion, we end up hurting each other. Not to justify what they did, not to say what they did was right. But Jesus said they're not, they don't know what they're doing, and so he prayed for them. And years later, Peter, his apostle, would say that when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He just said, okay, I'm going to leave vengeance up to God. Even Jesus did not try to get even. Even Jesus didn't. And if he didn't, again, I'm not saying that what they did to you was right. I'm not saying that what they did to you didn't hurt. And nor am I saying that when you seek to forgive them, you are endorsing them. To forgive someone is not to endorse misbehavior. You are not saying they did what they did was right. You can forgive somebody and still expect child support. You can forgive somebody and still expect them to go to jail. Grace does not exclude appropriate justice. Grace simply says, I'm leaving ultimate justice to God. I'm trusting him to judge correctly. And grace says, if God loves me, he must love them too. And this is for your benefit. The Bible says, see to it, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Wherever there's a fruit, there's a root. And wherever there's a fruit of bitterness, there's a root of hurt. And what God can do, he can go in and he can extract that root with the grace of God. And this happens as you pray for your enemies. So Jesus says simply, pray for those who hurt you. Pray for those who hurt you. Here's what I'm thinking. If you pray for your enemies, and I pray for my enemies, a lot of people are going to get prayed for. And I'm thinking that as you and I pray for our enemies, then a lot of skunks are going to be kept out of the camp. And won't the world smell a whole lot better? And so, Lord, we recommit ourselves now to, to pray for our enemies. Boy, they're there. I know that uh, you've brought them to mind even in this message, Lord. And, um, but now we ask you, Lord, to bless our enemies. Be to them who you've been to us. Be a source of grace and forgiveness. Do to them what you've done for us. You've rescued us and given us hope. Give us a second chance. Give it to them, Lord. You died for them just like you died for us, Jesus. And so we ask you to bless them. And we ask you, Lord, to, to meet us at that point of pain and to set us free, to release us from that hatred. We don't want that anymore. We receive your forgiveness, Lord, and now we give it to others. Through Jesus we pray. And all the church said, Amen.